right? And what legislation can you find the phrase separation of church and state? Is it A in the preamble? Is it B in the Constitution? Is it C in the Declaration of Independence? Or is it D in the Bill of Rights? Any guesses? C. It's actually E. None of the above. The phrase separation of church and state never appears in any piece of American legislation anywhere, ever. Good morning. My name is Jordan Sheffield. Today I'll be giving you a presentation on the, the state of separation of church and, church and state in America. In a perfect world, law would set clear guidelines so we know exactly when they are broken. Uh, however, it's often the case that laws are often as complex as the people that they govern. This presentation will not answer the question of who is right and who is wrong in this debate, but hopefully I can set a more clear context of the contention. Beginning with America's, we're going to begin with uh, America's history as a nation founded as a religious refuge. Next, we will examine the Constitution. I will explain how the phrase came about. We, just, we will discuss the, the historic trends, or lack thereof, and what kind of cases are tried, and the information that judges use to try these cases. And also, we will discuss, we will discuss how you can affect the debate. A documentary titled The Godly Family Protestant, Protestants in the Home follows the Protestant Reformation, which began in the 17th century by a Catholic monk named Martin Luther. He was willing against the establishment for what he perceived to be uncontrolled corruption. This split the church into two sects, Catholics on one side and Protestants on the other. One place agreement between Catholics and Protestants was that there should be a uniformity in religion. Uh, both sides believed that the, there was one true religion and it must be protected. And if you look at my map, you can see here that Europe was pretty evenly divided between the, the Catholic groups and the olive here, the Protestant groups, in blue here, and there's even a little bit of the Muslim groups on the southeast side. Now, in efforts to convert people or maintain their religious dominance, people would be imprisoned, tortured, or even put to death. The Puritans were part of that group, and in, this, in the 17th century, the Puritans left and first arrived on American shores. The website Digital History claimed that today, 8 million Americans can trace their ancestry back to 15 or 20,000 Puritans that left New England and migrated from uh, 1629 to 1640. Now we're going to jump ahead to the creation of the Constitution. We discussed this before, but I'm going to put this in context. This pie chart is a poll conducted by the First, uh, First Amendment Center, and they found that 67% 67 of Americans believe that there is a, the Constitution requires a clear-cut uh, separation between church and state. 50% uh, 50, 50 of these uh, respondents uh, strongly agree, only 28% disagree. But the phrase separation of church and state actually never appears in the Constitution. Uh, where, the, where the word it comes from in the Constitution is uh, what's called the Establishment Clause. And the Establishment Clause case states that uh, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of a religion. The phrase separation of church and state actually comes from a letter from Thomas Jefferson to some Danbury Baptists in Connecticut. And the Danbury Baptists wrote the letter in response to a fear that Connecticut was about to make a state-sponsored religion. And I have to paraphrase uh, Thomas Jefferson's response, but it mainly states, I contemplate with sovereign reverence that the act of the whole American people was built a wall between the separation, built a wall between church and state. I don't want to turn this into a history lesson, but my research did show that America was founded on uh, Christian principles. And 52 of the 55 drafters of the Constitution were members of the Orthodox Church. However, they did not, they did not technically intend for uh, America to be a Christian nation. Jefferson did admire Christian ethics, but according to Jonathan Wright's separation of church and, church and state, he was unimpressed by religious rituals and dogmas. So much so, and I found this kind of interesting, that he actually rewrote the New Testament, on reducing it only to the moral lessons. Uh, still, the phrase largely went unused until the U.S. Supreme Court first utilized the phrase in 1878 by Reynolds of the United States. Reynolds was a Mormon who challenged the anti-bigamy federal laws, challenged his right to a plural marriage, and um, he lost that case. The court decided that he could, uh, they could punish criminal activity without regard to religious affiliation. Uh, that case was in 1878. Now, what I wanted to do was look at more recent cases, like in the past 30 or so years, so I could be able to provide the class with a trend for how the current cases are being decided. 
and I never found one. Um, and I asked Mr. David Fowler, our, res our, our residential legal expert here, uh, why this was the case, and he told me in this quote. He said, if you're looking, if you're looking to explain why the Supreme, Door, Supreme, the Supreme Court does what it does, you ain't going to find it. And if you know uh, David Fowler, you know that's exactly how he said it. And the reason for this is the nature of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has uh, nine justices, and there are lifetime appointments made by a president who is hoping that his laws are upheld. So it is inherently a political position, because he's using the court to try to provide a bias in his favor. Also because in America, we tend to swing back between Dem Democratic and Republican presidents, uh, the, the court is pretty uh, evenly divided along ideologues. And all, almost all the cases I found the establishment cause cases were a 5-4 split. So the cases often depend on conservative or liberal, the, uh, on how conservative or liberal the last judge appointed happens to be. And these are obviously not Supreme Court justices, but to make it a little bit more relatable, if Simon always says no and Paul, Paul always says yes, Ren is really the only one that matters. Uh, however, there is a trend in the kinds of cases that are tried, and, and they usually fall into four main categories. Having the Ten Commandments or other biblical symbols on government grounds, faculty led prayer at school, an issue of free speech, or intelligent design or creation science being taught in school. I found the past 50 uh, establishment clause cases and created a bar chart to uh, express that data. These are 50 recent court cases. And uh, as you can see, the Ten Commandments or other biblical symbols on government grounds represented 12 of the last 50. Eight of the last 50 was prayer at school. 11 was uh, an issue of free speech. Five was intelligent design. And uh, there were 14 other cases, usually involved how a religious entity is going to be taxed. So in the four main categories, 36 of the 50 were of those, and only, there was only 14 of those. Now the information that the judges use to decide these cases are, um, they use a couple precedents, and the main one is the, the Lemon versus Kurtzman Supreme Court case, and it revolved around a, a law that was passed in 1971 by Pennsylvania legislators. <clears throat> the law was called the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1968, and it gave the government right to fund religious-based lessons. The case went to the Supreme Court where they found that the, uh, the law violated the, the establishment clause in the uh, First Amendment. The case gave birth to a precedent, a precedent known as the limit test. And the limit test states that all laws, first of all, must have a, a legislative, legislative purpose, a secular legislative purpose. And the primary purpose of the law must not be to, must not be to advance or inhibit religion. And it must not foster excessive government entanglement. Finally, this is how you can affect the outcomes of uh, how these cases are decided in the future. Uh, the first thing, probably one of the most important things you can do is just knowing the law. It's really important that you know that unless you are acting as an agent of a government or a state uh, government, you have the right to promote your religious views anywhere, at any time. On the other side of that, you have the right to challenge religious endorsements and by, made by officials in publicly funded areas. And the last thing, of course, is uh, voting. Voting for a president that cares about your cause and has the power to tip the scales of justice in your favor can drastically change how this debate is uh, shaped going forward. Those are my work cited. Any questions?